If you'll turn to Psalm 1, we'll continue our study of the poetic literature. And I trust you've seen from the little introduction we've already had to the Psalms that they're filled with meaning, theology, truth that is almost inexhaustible. We entitled this psalm, Contrasted Characters, but you could call it by other terms, titles, the two ways, the two roads, the two ends. Contrasted characters, and the godly man, we said, was described by what he didn't do. First of all, blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. We said there's a progression of sin here. First he walks in the ungodly counsel, then he stands and listens to them and does what they do, and he ends up sitting with them, becoming a part of them. Positively, though, his delight is in the law, the word of the Lord, and in his word does he meditate day and night. The consequence, he should be like a tree planted. And we said that spoke of security by streams of water, capacity, brings forth fruit, fertility, in its season, dependability, his leaf doesn't wither, perpetuity, and whatever he does will prosper, prosperity. We got half through it, which means if it takes an hour to get half through it, there must be a lot here. In the Psalms, if you don't meditate upon study, and if you have word ministry preached from the Psalms occasionally, you're missing a wealth, a storehouse, treasure house of deep truth that God has revealed. Most of them are messianic. You can find Messiah in practically every one of them, I suppose. So now we come to the second half of the psalm, the ungodly man. First we describe the godly man by what he does and doesn't do. And the consequence of that, he's like a tree. The ungodly man in verses 4 to 6. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. All right, first of all, we see the ungodly man is the antithesis of the godly man. In the phrase, the wicked are not so. He's all that the righteous is not. He's the opposite. He's the antithesis of the godly man. He does walk in the counsel of the ungodly. He does stand in the way of sinners. He does sit and scorn in the seat of the scornful. His delight is not in the word of the Lord, and he does not meditate in his word day and night. Therefore, he's not like a tree. What's he like? Chaff. What a comparison. Amen. Chaff. What's chaff good for? Well, even the squirrels and the monkeys won't eat chaff. The wicked are not so. He's the absolute antithesis of the godly man. As to his character and conduct, verse 1 says he goes from bad to worse. Remember what we gave you last time. There's a progression of sin mentioned here. Walking, standing, sitting. As to character and conduct, he goes from bad to worse. As to his nature, He's like chaff compared to a tree. As to his destination, the Bible says he will pass away. But he's like the chaff which the wind drives away. So first he's the antithesis of the godly man, and secondly his character is described, he's like the chaff which the wind drives away. David of course, it's picturing here the winnowing of the wheat. And I've seen this. I don't know where in a travel log movie or saw it over there in the Near East or where, but they still winnow wheat this way. Wheat and grain has chaff. You know, that's just the husk around it. It's absolutely worthless. No nutrition at all. In it. Absolutely 100% worthless. So I said a bird wouldn't even bother to pick it up. 
A bird has more sense than to pick up a piece of chaff. And they take their instruments like pitchforks and shovels and things, and they throw that. They get on the top of a hill, and they throw that into the air. They have a big pile of it, and they just start throwing it into the air. And as they do, the wind blows the chaff away. So he's using a figure here right out of his own experience. That's how he describes the righteous and the wicked. The righteous are like trees planted, security, by streams of water that are prosperous and fruitful. But the wicked, what do you do with chaff? They're like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Chaff is worthless in that it's both rootless and fruitless, unlike a tree. The destination of the ungodly, because he's like chaff, he's to be driven away by the fierce winds of God's wrath. You might compare that with Matthew 3, verses 11 and 12. John uses the same figure. Matthew 3, verses 11 and 12. John said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor. He means a threshing floor. He will gather the wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Same figure, and the same destination, and the same end. The wheat will be gathered together, the chaff will be destroyed. So we see the antithesis, we see his character, it's as chaff. We see the consequence of his life. Consequence of the godly man is verse 3, the consequence of his life is verse 5. The ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. First of all, it said he'll not be able to stand in the judgment. Judgment will be his downfall, in other words. He'll fall on his face. Because he who stands in the way of sinners in this life shall not be able to stand in the judgment in the next. Malachi 3.2 and Psalm 5.5. But who shall abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? He'll be like a refiner's fire. So who can stand when he appears? And in Psalm 5, verse 5, The foolish shall not stand in thy sight. So he's talking about the fact that in the judgment, the wicked will not be allowed to stand before God. They will fall. The judgment will be their downfall. Nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Remember the parallelism we taught you. The Bible's filled with parallelism, especially in the Old Testament. This is saying the same thing, but it's a parallel idea, in other words, but it's setting forth a different aspect of the same truth. And our sinners in the congregation of the righteous. See, sinners will have no place in the future congregation of the righteous, he's telling us. Now they're mixed. I don't know, there may be people here tonight who are lost. And they have the appearance of trees, but they're chaff. I don't know, you see. I'm not naive either. I'm not naive enough to think of the thousand people here that a thousand people are saved. Anybody that naive? I trust you're not. And I'm not thinking of any individuals. I'm just thinking of that many people getting together. See, they're mixed now. Jesus says in the parable of the wheat and tares, they're mixed now. But in the judgment, they won't be able to stand in the congregation of the righteous. That's Matthew 13. They're now mixed with the righteous in the churches. But the final separation will be made on judgment day when he separates the wheat from the chaff. Matthew 13, verse 24. 
And another parable he put forth, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like to a man that sowed good seed in his field, but while he slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. And when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then came the tares? What well, he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. And the servant said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up the wheat with them. Let both grow together, get the message, let both grow together in the churches until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles, and burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. So he's saying by this parable that the wheat and the tares are together. But on judgment day, the sinners will not be able to stand in the congregation of the righteous, like this congregation. If there are any here not saved, you won't be able to stand with us in the congregation of that day. That's what he's saying. Then the divine conclusion, verse 6. Back to Psalm 1. The divine conclusion to it all, For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Now the destiny of the righteous and the wicked are set forth here. First, the destiny of the righteous, the Lord knows the way of the righteous. Now to know in Scripture doesn't just mean to have knowledge about someone. I think we dealt with this in the doctrine of election in theology. But it doesn't just mean to have information concerning someone, but it implies an intimate personal relationship with someone else. It's synonymous in the Bible with election and choice and predestination. The Lord knows his people. Like Amos 3, 2, Jeremiah 1, 4 and 5, and Romans 8, 29. That to know here doesn't mean that God knows our names. Certainly knows our names. He knows the names of the wicked. But he means he knows us in the sense he has chosen us, he foreknew us, Amos 3, 2, and he loves us. He says to Israel, you only have I known of all the families of the earth. Well, he knew all about all the other nations, so that isn't what he's saying. He says to Israel that you are the one that I chose. I know you only. And in Jeremiah 1, 4 to 5, he says he knew Jeremiah before he was formed in the womb. Wow, that means somewhere, see, Adam produced the first child, and then the male has the seed, and God knew Jeremiah, he said, while you were still seed in somebody. That's why abortions and birth control and all is such a sin in the sight of God, because there are personalities there that God intends to bring forth, and you don't want to interfere with that. A lesson to the wise, and God will bless. Romans 8, 29. This is a knowledge of intimacy. Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. Foreknowing us. So it's not knowing about us, having information. In fact, I think when we taught you on this, we gave you other references that shows that it's the most intimate kind of knowledge. We read, Adam knew his wife, and she conceived. Well, he knew her. <laughs> he knew her before she conceived. You're Eve. He could have said that. I know you. But the Bible speaks of the most intimate relationship of love, physical relationship is knowing the other person. So when he says here in Psalm 1, he knows the way of the righteous. It isn't just knowledge about them, but it speaks of their choice and election, and so on. Then the destiny of the wicked in the same verse 6. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, but 
The way of the ungodly, he doesn't know, so they perish. And that's why we taught you about poetic parallelism first, because you see one half of the parallelism assumes the other. You see, now look at the verse and you'll see what we're talking about. Both pairs of the parallelism assumes the conclusion of the other. The Lord knows the way of the righteous, therefore it shall abide and not perish. The Lord does not know the way of the ungodly, therefore the way of the ungodly will perish. So it's saying the same thing, you see, by inverting it. And it assumes each part of the parallelism assumes the conclusion. He knows the way of the righteous, therefore it will abide. He doesn't know the way of the ungodly, therefore it perishes. So he doesn't have to say it twice. He just says it once concerning the righteous and the other way concerning the wicked. So God does not know their way means that he does not approve or accept their way of life, and he judges it. Now the way he's talking about in verse 6 is the way described in verses 1 to 5. The way of life, the two ways of life he's talking about in verses 1 to 5. And there are only two ways in the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. Two ends are described here, the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. Jesus describes those two ways in Matthew 7, 13 when he said, there's a broad way and a narrow way. He's speaking of the same way when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, you have any questions? If not, we're going to move on to another psalm. See, what I'm showing you, we're not going to go through the 150 psalms, but I'm showing you what depth is to be drawn from the poetic literature, especially in the Psalter. Psalm 2, a messianic psalm that I've entitled, The Day of the Lord. So I say you can do the same, make your own titles for them, but till you go through them as thoroughly as some of us have, then you can stay with our titles. The Day of the Lord, that isn't on here. You see, I didn't get that off the page. I got that out of my head. The Day of the Lord, because I believe that's what it's speaking about. Now, the authorship of Psalm 2. Remember Psalm 1, it didn't say who wrote it, though we believe David did, because most of them in the first book of the Psalter written by David. But the authorship of Psalm 2, we have no question who wrote it, according to Acts 4.25. Gives you an idea. God, who by the mouth of his servant David said, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? God spoke by servant David and said, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Well, what's the first verse of Psalm 2? Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? So we know who wrote this if we've ever bothered to read the book of Acts. So David wrote it. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. God's going to laugh one day at all of this rebellion. And the Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree, The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish from the way, when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all they that put their trust in him. That goes for healing or anything else. 
<laughs> now it's interesting if you notice there was four different people speaking there. In verses 1 to 3, man speaks. Verses 4 to 6, the father speaks. Verses 7 to 9, the son speaks. And in verses 10 to 12, the Holy Spirit speaks. Now you see, man says, they're raging, you see. He's talking in verses 1 to 3. And they say, let's plot and get together and break his bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. That's rebellious man talking. And then the Father speaks. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. Then he'll speak to them in his wrath. And then the Son speaks, starting verse 7. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, Thou art my Son. So we know that that's Jesus speaking. And then in verses 10 to 12, the Holy Spirit speaks, giving an exhortation. Be wise, therefore, O ye kings and judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. So we've got four divisions in the psalm. Man speaks, Father speaks, Son speaks, the Holy Spirit. The psalm is a prophetic psalm because it's quoted time and again in the New Testament. Again and again quoted in the New Testament. It's quoted in Acts 4.25, Acts 13.33, Hebrews 1.5, Hebrews 5.5, 5, and other places in Hebrews. It's quoted in Revelation 2.27, Revelation 12.5, Revelation 19, 15. I would say on the basis of that it's both prophetic and messianic. Anybody question that? All of those places, and some I didn't mention, that it's quoted must be quite significant for the church if the New Testament quotes it that many times. So you see, studying the Psalms is not just to get you inspired, but to get you trained more in the Word of God. Now it has a twofold prophetic reference. One is that it applies to the first advent, according to Peter in Acts 4, 25 to 27. He applies it to the first advent. And then John, in his vision in Revelation, Revelation 19.5, applies it to his second advent. So, not only is the psalm quoted over and over, but it actually speaks of both advents. For example, Acts 4. 25, 27. You see how Peter applies it and then how John does. The scope of it is quite extensive. Acts 4, 25. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Then he applies it in this way. The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth, here's his application, against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together. So he quotes Psalm 2, how the rulers and leaders would be gathered against God and his anointed, and Peter says that's exactly what they did when they crucified him. Herod, Pilate, the Gentiles, and Israel. Then John moves beyond first advent in Revelation 19 and applies Psalm 2 to the second advent. When he sets his king on his holy hill in Zion, a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise God, all you servants, and fear him, both small and great. Then he speaks of the Son of God coming with his mighty army.
Verse 5 speaks of the fact that the world is called upon to fear him. And then the whole passage deals with God judging the world through Jesus Christ. Now we'll begin with an exposition, the worldwide rebellion, verses 1 to 3. The worldwide rebellion, verses 1 to 3. This is where man speaks. First, we see the fury of the rebellion. The fury of the rebellion. Why do the people rage? Why do the people rage? If you have a marginal reading, I got this out of the ASV. They're making a tumult. Tumultuously assembled. Why are they assembled and making a tumult? Why do the heathen rage? It's a picture of the world insurrection. For example, the angry mobs that we see gathering today because of political strife or race prejudice or persecution of Christians or the youth burning down the establishment on the college campuses and so forth. You get a picture of mob action here. Why do the heathen rage? Then we see sinful meditation. And the people imagine a vain thing. Why do they rage and imagine a vain thing? Sinful meditation. Now in Psalm 1, verse 2, we see right meditation. He meditates in the word of the Lord day and night. And here we see vain meditation. Vain in the sense that it's empty and will come to nothing. So the fury of rebellion, verse 1. Then the focus of rebellion, verse 2, is focused in the leaders and on the Lord and his anointed. The kings of the earth have set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together. It's focused in the leaders against the leader, the Lord, and his anointed. Now we just read in Acts 4 how that Peter applied that to Pilate and to the King Herod, to the Gentiles and the Jews. And what's their sinful decision? Verse 3. Their sinful decision in verse 3. They took counsel together. They all voted. And they came up with this. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Whose bands? The Lord's and his Messiah, the Anointed One. Let us break their bands asunder and cast his cords away from us. Now what are these cords in these bands. You see, the world hates subjection to the heavenly king. And their decision with one accord is to break off these restraints. You notice one of the things that characterize this contemporary generation is its revolt against authority of any kind, whether it's religious authority or political, police, or whatever, governmental. So what are these bands? Well, they suggest several things. The scriptures suggest several things. First of all, these bands that they want to break from off them is the church. That is the Christian testimony to truth and its witness against sin. These things that are bands upon them. Jesus said, we are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And the world hates us for that. He said in John 15, the world hates us. I recognize that the world doesn't hate most people in the churches, but the world hates you. The world hates tongue talkers. The world hates people who have the total faith message. The world hates righteousness. And we read last time in Revelation 11.10 how the world rejoiced when the two witnesses were slain, who tormented them day and night with their preaching. So the bands and the bonds, the cords that bind this world, first of all, it would be our presence. If we were just out of this world, it would be a happier place for the world. 
Another band and cord that God binds this sinful world with is man's own conscience. First the presence of the salt and the light, and then his own conscience. Romans chapter 2. See, we covered this in the Sermon on the Mount concerning what the salt meant. We are salt preserving the earth. We are the only light it has as Christians. It has no light except we give it light. Now his conscience in Romans 2 binds him. God has given him a conscience. It speaks of unregenerate man, but he has a conscience. Verse 15, 14 and 15. For the Gentiles, which do not have the law, do by nature the things contained in the law. See, they have the law written in their heart. So those not having the law are a law unto themselves. They show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or excusing one another. See, God has placed his law, his unwritten law, in the heart of every man. And it's his conscience, of course, that bears witness to the fact that this is God's voice saying, do this, don't do that. There's no man so depraved that he doesn't have some measure of knowledge of right and wrong. The law is written in his heart. So his conscience, he'd like to get rid of that. Of course, in the study on Romans, we showed how he can sear his conscience and he can ignore it until it's not too much of a reliable guide, but it's still a conscience. Another thing that hinders him, that's a cord and a band that restrains him, is spoken of by Paul in 2 Thessalonians 2.7. And as most reliable interpreters believe, this is the Holy Spirit spoken of here. Second Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.7 For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now prevents will prevent until he be taken out of the way. The consensus of opinion is that this is a reference to the Holy Spirit, or the Holy Spirit in the people of God since the church will be taken out of the way. And the only thing that's holding back the full expression of iniquity is he who holds it back. King James says, letteth, but letteth means prevent. It's just the opposite to what let means today. He who's preventing iniquity from coming forth in its fullness is the one preventing it until he be taken out of the way. Then shall that wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish. In other words, then they can just go on and receive all of the unrighteousness through Antichrist and the devil they want because they perish. Now they wish they had the restraint moved. But God is controlling affairs by having he, whoever he is in verse 7, you have to make him somebody. Paul says the mystery of iniquity can't be released until he is taken out of the way. Who's holding it back? Well, the devil isn't holding it back. So it would have to be God in some form, and so as I say, doubtless the Holy Spirit. He'll be removed one day. And so when the church is removed and the Holy Spirit is removed, then man's conscience will not be enough to withhold all the iniquity that will come forth. A sinner's nature is like a pressure cooker. And the Holy Spirit and his conscience and the presence of Christians and the law and the do's and don'ts of government hold that pressure in, just like a pressure cooker. One day God will just take the lid off and it will all spew forth. You don't want to be here when it happens. You almost think it's already happening when you look at and see and hear some things. A fourth thing that is a cord or restraint, according to Scripture, would be government. Romans 13, government. The law and threat of punishment. See, man can't do all he wants to do. He would if he could, but he can't because he values his freedom more than just getting his own way. And you better believe it, that sweet neighbor you've got and everybody in town that's unconverted if there were no laws or restraints. You would want to live in that community. You really wouldn't. Man's true nature would come forth. Because you see, 
the one that is so thoughtful of others would have to stop being thoughtful of others or he'd starve to death. Because those who would give full vent right away to their newfound freedom to sin would just take over. They'd go in and simply shoot the manager of the supermarket and take over. Or whatever, the banks and everything else. So you could neither buy nor sell unless you got your gun and acted like they did. Unregenerate man we're talking about. So the laws and the restraints do keep sin in check. If there was no threat of punishment or jail, you might be surprised what would come forth in your neighborhood tomorrow. If you think humanity is so good, I trust God never lets you see how they really look by experience to Him. So we can sum up verses 1 to 3 concerning worldwide rebellion. And we have in this rebellion a threefold fulfillment. We see it fulfilled at the first advent when Jew and Gentile, kings and rulers alike, banded together against God and His anointed. That's Acts 4.27. When the whole world was represented there banding against the Lord's anointed. And then the second aspect of this worldwide rebellion extends to the present day in the struggle between God and sin, Christianity and the world. And then it has a future application after 2 Thessalonians 2.7 comes to pass. And that is the battle of Armageddon, Revelation 19. When the nations see the king return to set up his kingdom and they all band together and make one last vain effort to overcoming, to overthrow his rule. And that'll be the day of the Lord. Then verses 4 to 6 divine intervention. We see worldwide rebellion. Now I've entitled this section divine intervention, verses 4 to 6. This is when the Father speaks. Divine intervention. First of all, the folly of such rebellion. The folly of such rebellion, verse 4. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. When man rebelled at the first advent and while he's still rebelling, and especially at Armageddon, Revelation 19, when he rebels against God's Messiah, the world rebels against God's Messiah, God is laughing. He that sitteth in the heavens. You see where he is? He that sitteth in the heavens. He's sitting up there on his sovereign throne. That throne depicts his sovereignty. And so that speaks of the utter folly of anybody rebelling against somebody they can't touch. Now God's laughter doesn't mean he thinks their rebellion is humorous. He isn't laughing like you might laugh at something funny. <laughs> you don't want to ever hear God laugh at rebellion. It's not the kind of laughter you would suspect. So it doesn't mean he thinks sin and rebellion is humorous, but it's a poetic description of his attitude over the utter ridiculousness of a creature <laughs> shaking his fist at his creator when all the creator has to do is just squash him. I get the picture when I read this of an ant climbing up on his anthill and lifting one of those little old feelers at you. You're standing there with your foot. See, you're going to take a step, and your foot is poised. And he just sticks that little old antenna up and defies you. <laughs> That's the way I see God here. And all he has to do is just put his foot down, squash you. That's what he's going to do. He's just going to squash his enemies. He that sitteth in the heavens will laugh. You see, man is so insignificant in his rebellion that in Genesis 11, the only way 
Moses could describe it. God had to come down to see what they were doing. They were so insignificant. He says, let us go down and see what they're doing. They're up to no good. <laughs> well, God didn't have to come down. He knew all about it. But that's the only way the scriptures can describe is to show you how insignificant man's rebellion against the sovereign God is. Let us go down to see what he's up to. Well, God's laughter doesn't mean that he thinks it's funny. <laughs> if you're a sinner, you never want to hear God laugh at your rebellion. Psalm 37, verses 12 and 13 speaks of him laughing at rebels. 37, 12, and 13. In Proverbs 1, verses 24 and 26, he speaks of laughing at sinners. So his laugh is a laugh in derision that they would even be so foolish as to rebel against a sovereign creator. What can man do anyway in his rebellion? If the whole world voted tomorrow to stop the world, they couldn't. Or if they said stop the world, it's that, I think it's a secular song that I heard the title somewhere, stop the world, I want to get off. Let them go ahead. They couldn't. <laughs> if they voted that they were just going to seal themselves in and not even think of God anymore, they couldn't shut him out because they couldn't even take a breath without him. He gives them their breath to reject him. Yes, he gives the sinner the life and the breath to say no to him. That's why he's responsible, by the way. Well, the folly of rebellion. Next, the failure of rebellion. Verses 4 and 5. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. God will have them in derision. He will look in scorn upon their futile attempts to resist him. He will speak in his wrath. Now, it doesn't mean he's just going to speak to them and rebuke them. But to speak in his wrath means he's going to punish them and judge them. And he'll vex them in their sore displeasure. Do you ever feel vexed? <laughs> Vexing and frustration are kind of synonymous terms, except vexing implies the idea of someone causing you your misery. And so if you can think of a frustrated person that somebody, big bully, for example, that you went to school with that would vex you and torment you, and there wasn't anything you could do about it, because if you did anything at all, it was worse. And so God is going to have them in derision and he's going to vex them in his sore displeasure. They just can't do a thing about it. The time's coming when they can do utterly nothing. Absolutely nothing. They'll be vexed and frustrated. He will strike terror into them. Confound them. Cause panic. Vexation. It says, then God will speak, verse 5. That means he isn't speaking now, no. Then God will speak. God has spoken his final word to this world in Jesus Christ. And then he's going to speak in the day of the Lord through Jesus Christ, of course. But then he's going to speak in judgment. And then the frustrator of rebellion, the folly of rebellion, failure of rebellion, and frustrator of rebellion. Verse 6. The frustrator of rebellion, God says, I've set my king upon my holy hill in Zion. This is God's reply to the kings of the earth. This is God's reply to man's rebellion. This is God's answer to the rulers and the kings. He says, I have set my king upon Zion's hill, where all events will culminate. So actually, you see, we've moved beyond first advent now into the millennium when he sets his king upon Zion because in the first advent they tried to make him a king and Jesus said no. And then we read again and again how he will come at the second advent and reign and rule. So at the first advent, his enemies set him on the cross and had him in derision. You know, they derided him saying, if thou be the son of God, come down from the cross. The second advent, 
God will set him on the throne. Men set him on the cross and derided him. God will set him on the throne and he will have them in derision. It will all be reversed. And then the king's declaration and his kingdom, verses 7 to 9. King's declaration and his kingdom, verses 7 to 9. The king declares his relationship to God. He's speaking. He says, now I'm going to say something. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, and this day have I begotten thee. So he declares his unique relationship to the Lord that they're deriding and rejecting and rebelling against. Now, what does this day I have begotten thee refer to? Well, we've already taught you on some other subjects. That refers to the resurrection. Acts 13.33. Acts 13.33, where Peter speaks of the resurrection. And quotes Psalm 2. It says, God has fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he raised up Jesus again, raised him from the dead, as it is written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. So Peter here tells us that this phrase refers to the resurrection from the dead. This day I have begotten thee from the dead. He's the firstborn from the dead, of course. Romans 1.4, Colossians 1.18. So he's setting forth his right to reign and rule on the throne God set him on. He says, I'm his son, and I'm the first begotten from the dead. He declares his unique relationship in verse 7. Then in verses 8 and 9, he makes a declaration of his kingdom, concerning his kingdom, verses 8 and 9. Now here's the decree. Secondly, first the father said, you're my son, now I said, secondly, ask of me and I will give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. And then verse 9, thou shalt break them with a rod of iron and thou shalt dice them in pieces like a potter's vessel. He said, just ask me. Now, we are joint heirs with Christ. I don't know why people have to hunt for sermons but here's another sermon on faith. The son gets whatever he asks for, not just because he's the son, but because he's the son and because he always asks in faith. We are sons of God. We're joint heirs with Christ, the scriptures say. That means we get what we ask for if we meet the conditions, which he always did. So all he has to do is ask for the world. Father said, ask me for it, and I'll give it to you. And so... If you've ever been to church, you've heard a missionary sermon preached on Psalm 2. And most of you probably don't recognize Psalm 2 unless you study the Psalms thoroughly as something that you're familiar with. But you do recognize verses 8 and 9 if you've ever been in any denominational church. For a year, consistently, somebody came in, or the pastor himself, preached an evangelistic sermon on verse 8. Ask of me and I'll give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. And I've never heard them quote verse 9. What's he going to do with them when he asks for them? He's going to break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces <laughs> like a potter's vessel. And I don't know how much money has been donated to missions on verse 8. But they'd never gotten a penny if they'd have read verse 9. <laughs> or if they'd put them together like he does. The son puts them together. I said Jesus put them together. I didn't make it up. You got verse 9 in your Bible? Okay, let's take them together. Certainly there's an aspect in which when he asks for the world, he's asking for his sheep too. But how does he get the world? He gets it through judgment. He's going to judge it. Matthew 25, he's gathering all nations and judging them. He doesn't say anything about here. Saving them is going to dash them in pieces. He's going to break them with a rod of iron, which speaks of his rule. 
Well, I don't know if that inspires you or not, but that's what it says. And uh, I wouldn't rule out the fact that in a general sense, of course, asking for the world includes the sheep. We're in it. But it doesn't say anything about sheep. It just says what he's going to do with the world when he gets it. And he hasn't done it yet, so it speaks of the future. You can put with that all the passages that speak of him breaking his enemies with a rod of iron, ruling over them the context of the whole psalm. Well, the whole psalm speaks of judgment, especially this passage. Have you noticed that? The whole psalm speaks of judgment, rebellion and judgment. I don't know how you're going to get missions out of that, but if people are not going to pay the cost to read the context before they preach, then the people that follow, people that don't read the context before they preach, will have to pay the cost of not reading it for themselves before they listen to preachers who preach before they read the context before they preach. <laughs> it is amazing how much is preached that God didn't say it that way. And this is just an example of it. Now, I, as I say, I've already said it twice. Why say it three times? But we will because <laughs> I don't like to leave anyone with bad feelings. Yes, God gave him the whole world. He asked for it. That's what's implied here. That includes his sheep. But what does he do with the world? He judges it, and he breaks it, and he dashes it in pieces. So I'm not making it up. I didn't even have to add the other about the sheep because he didn't mention them. So if you can, with good conscience, preach a missionary sermon on verse 8, go ahead, but please include verse 9 and say that the sheep are included in that or something. I'm just trying to make honest interpreters out of everybody. Amen. Stay with the word. It's inspired. We've got countless texts for missionary sermons. You know, if you are wanting to preach missionary sermons, but any sermon that's preached is a missionary sermon. I should say sermons by missionaries to get financial support for the missions. That's what it's preached for. But everybody's a missionary, and every sermon, if it's from the Word of God, is a missionary sermon. Then finally, the solemn exhortation, verse 10 to 12, verses 10 to 12. We see lingering, lingering mercy in verses 10 to 12, first of all. 10 to 12a, 10 to 12a. Be wise now, therefore, all you kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry. So, this is a special warning to the leaders, but it includes the people under their leadership. But the leaders are those who lead in rebellion against truth and righteousness. So it's a special warning that the end is near and they should do two things while mercy is available. Serve the Lord with fear. Amen. And secondly, kiss the Son. Now keep in mind the Oriental Near Eastern concepts you'll find in the Bible because that's where it was written in the Near Eastern world. And to kiss the son doesn't mean you go up and kiss him on the cheek or lips or something, but the picture is of the leaders of the world, when they get before a sovereign king, they would bow down and kiss his feet or kiss his hands. You've got people, they'll kiss the pope's hand, his feet and ring and the whole bit. That's the idea. They're bound before His Holiness. Someone that they consider great, that is. I said His Holiness in quotes, since people might misunderstand that. He's no more holy than you. Maybe not as much. I won't judge, but can you imagine anybody calling you His Holiness? Well, I don't know what I would do with that. I'd just have to back off and say, you ought to repent. <laughs> Because that's reserved for His Holiness only, and that's the Lord. But to kiss Him means to submit to Him. And so to kiss Him is to acknowledge His authority and admit who He is. Because when He returns as King, then it will be too late. Because He admonishes the leaders 
and of course all men to serve him with fear and kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. So when he returns, it'll be too late to do anything about it. Now you can bow before him, is what he's saying. Then you will bow, but it will be in judgment. Because in that day, Philippians 2, every knee shall bow, and every tongue confess that Jesus is the Christ. In Revelation 6, verses 15 to 17, when he comes again, it'll be too late to serve him, to fear him, or to kiss him. The kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall upon us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? So he said, Serve him now and kiss him now. Acknowledge his sovereignty now while there's yet time, lest his wrath be aroused. If his wrath is kindled but a little, it will destroy you in the day of the Lord. So the psalm points to the first advent, the intervening period, but basically primarily points to the second advent. When God sets his king on his holy hill in Zion, when he has his enemies in derision, when he vexes them in his sore displeasure, when he receives the inheritance of the earth, and Matthew 25 says he judges it and dashes his enemies in pieces. The battle of Armageddon. He inherited the world to rid it of his enemies and set up his reign and rule.